No, no, that's totally true. We had a few pilot smaller clients maybe before them that were, let's just say that I'm not sure they were really paying clients, but we we were we were teasing out like, well, what is it we do? Like, how do we help an organization understand its information and then build a, a growth strategy on top of that first party data? But um, yeah, I mean, like that's that's how it got going. 2020 happened, the pandemic happened. We got into a, a great relationship helping Ancestry kind of rethink how they wanted to orchestrate and measure their marketing success, uh, which then led into like a whole slew of where we're at today around like having an actual um, solution and technology to, to do those things and, and more. Hi everyone, this is Joshua Hoffman and Alex Garashenko and welcome to another episode of the Masters in Marketing Agency podcast where we deconstruct the why and how agency owners found their success, and in season four, focus on how we can give and receive referrals. Today, I have Matt Butler, the co-founder and CEO of Bonsai Data Solutions, a marketing solution that measures and generates incremental value through first-party data, pairing unprecedented marketing ROI and business growth for enterprises, series stage, and startups alike. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for joining us. So I want to start with a couple of my favorite topics, uh, which is discipline and motivation. We might have talked about that a little bit on our last call, um, because once upon a time, uh, you were first chair trumpet, uh, played D1 college football and, and batted 350, which I got to get in there, uh, as well as worked at Google for, for a number of years. Um, so all of which obviously, you know, take a lot of practice and skills. So and, and, and you can separate this and I'll ask, you know, this in two different ways, but I'll throw the, the questions at you. What motivates you and, and how did you create the discipline to reach those goals? Yeah, great question, Josh. And it has been a minute since uh, my baseball days. So, but it's always <laughs> exciting to think about them. Uh, yeah, uh, discipline and focus um, certainly are part of it. I remember, I remember actually taking myself back to those days uh, I think I was, oh gosh, I forget what year I was in college. Um, there, there was a similar type of question asked once at like a get together, a dinner. And, uh, you know, of course, like they asked me to say something about it and I wasn't prepared, you know, it's not kind of like now. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the thing that like resonated internally for me though, is like this idea of, I think sometimes people think of, uh, discipline and focus as being these sort of um, skills in a vacuum that you can, you know, oh, you need to have it, you can train it. It's just a matter of like powering up that discipline bar or, and then like, or, you know, same thing with focus, right? And I think my big, the, for me, maybe it isn't quite as straightforward as that. The discipline and focus comes when you have like a, a why behind it, like a reason that you want something, right? And then there is that element of the belief, right? Like you, uh, it, speaking for myself, I, I tend to find that if there's something out there that I want to achieve, if, if I tell someone about it, that's great. But by and large, people don't, they're not necessarily, not, no one's necessarily expecting success for you. Um, and that does, it comes across as really negative, but like the reality is like, you have to believe it yourself first. And so like, I think the, the mantra I used to use was like calm confidence. And I, I don't know if that's necessarily how I think about that in day-to-day -day life at Bonsai or business, but I think there's an element of like, hey, you have to have not just a decision on where you want to go, but you have to have that belief for something there to give you then the platform to build your discipline and your focus, right? Because if you don't have that, you know, you can try to, you know, plan out your your goals, or I need to learn this skill, or I need to build this way, and you know, follow so and so step process. The reality is, you're you're, you're not going to do it, right? Like, th those those go hand in hand for me, anyway. Uh, I love that you said the belief part because uh, I, I wrestled in in middle school and high school, and our uniforms in high school, rather than wearing like you know our team's colors and and brand and everything. Uh, all we did is we wore a shirt that said believe, uh, and that was our whole mantra for, for wrestling. Um, I actually have, it's, I've kept it since that day. It's this whole thing that what makes a, a, a successful wrestler. And it really goes to all of life. Cause I think it's just a great lesson, which uh, is all about just going hundred percent. But um, 
I, I think that's awesome that you brought up the belief because it's it's kind of what's run my life. So I, I totally agree with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna dig in a little further though, because again, this is my favorite topic, and then we'll get to business <laughs> stuff. But like, why did you want the success? Like you reached three pretty darn successful things. And there's a lot of people who want to do it and maybe didn't get there for a million reasons. And, and I'll kind of ask a question about that in a second. But like, why did you want the success? In, in the give context, us like the give us the real, give us the real. Yeah, no, in the context of like, you know, my my former time in athletics, right? Like in the context of that, or even before that in music as a kid, like I think, you know, with music, I grew up in a musical family, right? And so now as I got older, my passions weren't continually drawn to like build a music career, but like, you know, adopting the trumpet or, you know, doing whatever, right? Like that came out of like, yeah, like. I'm surrounded by, you know, that was a big part of my my upbringing, my environment. Like, obviously, love, you know, my my family was wasn't as great, and so that like passion drove, you know, some element of like, yeah, I want to do this and I want to do it well. Taking it into baseball, that you know, kind of back to what ultimately drove me like longer, right? Like, I love, I just love, I played baseball since I was, you know, one. That's the old story, right? Like. You know, I could swing a bat before I could stand up. That was sort of one of the, you know, jokes that my, my mom would tell, right? But I don't I don't know if that's true, by the way. It doesn't sound true. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but they, you know what I mean? You get the idea, right? Like, it was like, yeah, no, I love doing this. This is something that I always saw myself, um, you know, the, the, the love of, of, of the pursuit of doing it was always there. And then, like, the decision of, like, do I want to be great at this or not? felt pretty natural to me, right? And then, so then it was more a matter of, I guess, how I think about what I, you know, how I try to spend my time and of those things that I pursue and go after, like, I'm just always trying to do, I'm just trying to be the best one at it, right? And so, um, so that like carried me through, um, you know, a decent amount of time in athletics and, and, and in endeavors like that, you need that by the way, right? Like there's no, there's frankly like, you're not gonna come close to having any measure of success at certain levels unless you're marrying a little bit of that passion with, with, uh, that belief. What I really like about that is you kind of, you kind of said the same thing in a different way, which really solidifies the point. And the way that I heard it is whether it was the music or the baseball, you, you just had this belief that it was possible. Uh, and then you put in the work. So like, and, and maybe that's why my coach, you oh. know, put belief is because that was always the first step. And then you put in the work and then, you, and, and it, sometimes I, I'm amazed by these people who like, I know this sounds, I don't know if this sounds bad, but like they think like their parents convince them that they're like the most special person in the world, which everyone is and everyone isn't kind of thing. But like <laughs> just that belief alone makes them like do great things because they expect that they expect from their birth that they were going to do great things. And that's the reason. And I think you're kind of saying something similar in there. I think a lot, I think we're all driven by what we enjoy, whether it just be fun or like the love of it. Right. And like I, to me, it like, yes, like you have to have that love of it. I can't tell you why I loved and love baseball it's just that's just true and then like yeah then the next step is you know what do you want to do about that and those of us given the you know kind of license to believe i think it's a fun thing to do like believe in yourself so i want to i want to double click one more time in this and if your answer is the same then we we know the truth <laughs> behind it but um what do you think makes you different than someone who maybe had the same goals but didn't make it in in, in all three disciplines or each discipline or you know um, ultimately, I, I don't know. I think certainly two things come to mind, I guess. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have some measure of success, but it was always interesting. It, it was almost always in the context of some, uh, I wouldn't say like external doubt or issue, but like, you know, uh, athletics, again, back to baseball as an example. Uh, after the age of 12, I essentially was no longer like the profile for someone who should be playing baseball, right? I was not big, very small, G generally speaking, compared to like an Olympian, like not a good athlete, right? Like that's not a good, that's a trifecta of problems, right? If you're like assumed to continue to success. So, so yeah, it's like, yeah, I had it, but I had that sort of like, well, yeah, he's doing fine for now. Like, that's cool, but isn't that, um, 
it's sort of like a, oh, it's a pleasant surprise or that, you know, that's a cool story, but like, we don't expect you to continue to succeed, right? Because it's, it's not typical. So, you know, people talk about that, like, you know, people use that in different ways for motivation. Some people like really internalize that as like, oh, you know, crit criticism of me gives me drive to prove people wrong. Um, I think for me, it was more of just like, I was always dealing with that sort of general, like imperfect situation. There was sort of adversity around it. So my success never felt like easy. And so I got a comfortable feeling like, yeah, it's just hard to succeed. So like, you can keep going because you've accepted that fact, right? So I think that's one of the things, I didn't mean to cut you off, sorry. No, keep going. Yeah, so, so I guess number one was because it was never entirely easy, like I think that helped me, right? Like straight away when, you know, you, you see this all the time in certain, like sports has got a classic problem of, You've got, you know, people who are like, you know, phenoms, right? That don't ever end up panning out professionally, like yeah, as adults. And now part of that's a math thing, but another part of it is a lot of people made it very, very far without ever it being hard. And then they experience difficulty very late compared to others. And then it's like, just they, they can't handle it, right? Um, I think that's... I said there were two reasons and now that I got off on this tangent, I feel like well, I'm maybe gonna... maybe I'll remind you of one because you, you kind of tapped in uh to one of our favorite topics. And I, I wrote I have a doc that I kind of write and and I, I wrote it down and I saw Alex kind of shake his head. Yes. Um so one of our favorite topics is we call it like fuck you motivation. Um, because a lot of times that turns out to be like the strongest motivators. So um, you know, can you talk did you have it? Can you talk a little bit towards like fuck you motivation? Yeah. I like that term. Uh, <laughs> and maybe I, Alex, I, you know, I was typing and I was like, maybe we should uh, have another podcast just called Fuck You Motivation. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I, I do like, there's a, there's probably a market for that. Um, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, the way I would always feel about that is like, yeah, I mean, there'd be times when I would say, I wouldn't try to go people into like, you know, razzing me or digging, digging me. But like, I, I do think I had uh, a little bit more of a spark in the face of like essentially that you know that 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 f you mentality as opposed to like someone lavishing you with you know oh you're great isn't this wonderful like i didn't really i never responded that well to like overarching praise but if you really wanted to get my gears going right go ahead and you know like poke the bear a little bit right like say like yeah no you know what you can't do it like i, I knew you couldn't do it right then it's like all right let, let's see about that right like there's uh, I think, I think that drives people in many ways. I think that's important too. Um, and I think you need to call on that sometimes too, by the way. So like there, your, your motivations and like the, the thing that will keep you disciplined and focused isn't the same every single day. And there's these periods that, you know, that might be something you need to tap into all the time, right? Like if you're just like constantly acting like the world's against you every day, like, you know, I don't know if that's sustainable, but like at, at times when you need it, right, that's a, that can be a really helpful resource. Yeah, I, I think you nailed probably my favorite thing about the topic, which is that, you know, you can't, we do have short and long-term motivators, but it's it's hard day to day to just grasp at the same motivator every time. And and where I kind of baked it in is, is I call it like the half-life of motivation, which is every motivator that you have has like a certain power, a certain certain strength that can go a day, can go an hour, can go years. Yeah. Um, but what you have to do is you almost have to identify that first half-life or like the strongest point of the motivator and then almost create a, a focus or a discipline um, as soon as possible and then obviously act on it. And I, and I know there's like plenty of like research around this, right? But like, I think we're all naturally wired to remember like the, the negatives, right? More than some of our like successes and positives, right? So it's also like, that's just a, a fact. And so I think that it can be a more available motivator. It's because we're happy to be focusing on, you know, I'll never forget this one uh, before college, actually, I remember like there was a, a big regional tournament. I went off in one game and had like, you know, probably my best game of the summer. And it was on the campus of Notre Dame. Notre Dame was not one of the schools that decided to offer me a scholarship. And I remember at the end of the game, you know, teams are going back to their buses and like the, you know, the head coach comes down and I won't say his name, but you can look it up. And he's like, <laughs> hey, you know, he comes and finds me like, oh, you were great today, you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. You know, I'll see you out in the field next year. I'll be at Michigan, right? Like, um, you know, it, 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 you know, I, 
before that game started, I knew exactly where I was. I knew that that guy, you know, had passed me over, right? Like those are like very, you know, you, you, you'll have that in business too, right? And so I think that that is, um, that's helpful. It can help you, you grow for sure. And, and before we get into some of the business stuff, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about some personal philosophies because the last time we spoke, you spoke, you mentioned something that I think is worth bringing up and that's that you can't stand complaining. Um, so can you go off on that for a second? Yeah, let me complain about complaining for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, I was trying, when I wrote the <laughs> question, I was like, I was really how I wrote it. I was like, can you complain a little bit about complaining? <laughs> yeah, let me, let me give you five good complaining minutes. No, uh, the, I, I think a really limiting thing I see is, um, you know, I think we all want a just world. And I think it is painful to realize, and you're confronted with it every day of like, things are not fair. A lot of bad stuff happens that you can complain about either like in your, with work, with a customer, like something amazing that didn't get recognized. You know, you can get outright screwed, right? You know, there, there's plenty, right? I think we all probably have our, our horror stories, right? Especially, you know, pulling up a bar stool and, and, and kind of, going into it, right? It can be very cathartic to kind of share those things, but to really internalize and then use those things as things that, you know, reasons to not accomplish something or to not do something or to respond. I think that limits a lot of people. I see it all the time of, you know, you are, you're almost permanently going to be in a situation where something wasn't provided for you that you frankly probably earned or deserved. And, and, and so you can dwell on that because it isn't going to be fair, but like, we don't really ever think about like people don't try to take for granted all the advantages that they get and the blessings that they have. But the reality is that they're there every day. Um, you know, and it can be kind of dumb to go through them all. Like, cause I think they're, they're mainly cliche, but like, I'm talking to you on a webcam, right? I must be in a world, you know, I live in America. I, we have, the internet, like I get to drive a car, there's a road outside my house, right? My kids have a school, like if you really want to break down fair, right? Like most people in situations where we're complaining are usually actually on the very far end of fortune, not on the bottom. Yeah, so I, like, that's the root of it for me is like on the complaining side, it's like, wait a second, let's center ourselves and like in the grand scheme of things, are you really you know, there are people who probably deserve to complain. Very rarely do you meet those people. Well, and I would argue the ones, a lot of the people that have right to complain and don't end up being the most successful people that, that you mm -hmm. meet typically. Um, yeah. And I totally agree with you. I, I've always had this rule for myself of, uh, you know, if you're going to complain, either do something bad or shut your mouth, you know, like we don't have time for that. Um, yeah, 100%. You got to look for the solutions right away. Like you spend your time complaining. It's just, I know Josh has this thing, he calls it um, stress-free shampoo, but you should basically, without going into it, unless Josh, you want to, but you you surround yourself with this like negative thought as you're complaining about the things and you just, you get into the cycle of consistently yeah. thinking about it instead of like, I got to get out of this. What's the solution? Let's just focus on that. Yeah, the feeling is painful and a lot of people, like I failed constantly, right? And it sucks. And you can put complaining on as a way to like give yourself an excuse to not feel so bad about those failures. But you know, you'll live, right? Like people who fail, like all the people who are successful have failed their way to that success. And so I think a lot of times complaining is just, you know, people try to make it easier on, you know, take some of that burden away. And like it, it's sort of like with anything negative in life, right? Like it's okay to have those feelings. Like you don't need to run from them by complaining. Yeah, I to to close out that stress free shampoo theory, a, a lot of it is is basically like, you know, the people that are really stressed, they usually surround themselves with stress free shampoo and stress free poems and stress free whatever, and and all you're doing is surrounding yourself with the word stress, even though it says stress free, and and I think what Alex was kind of getting at is, is complaining is the same thing where, you know, you start to complain and then you make it your personality, even though you know you don't want to keep complaining, but it becomes you. And you post memes about it. And you post. You think it's a silly little Instagram post, but you're really like making your personality. And uh, the other couple things I wanted to say, uh, based on, on what you were saying, is you know, and I think this is fairly common. It's not like this is you know a new new 
thing that I'm saying, but a lot of people think the world affects them and, and some people think that they can affect the world. And I think those are the people that tend to complain are the ones that think that the, the world affects yeah. you and, oh, I can't do anything about it because this is just how it is. Um, which, you know, if you believe that it's the truth, uh, but the opposite can also be true. Um, and I just heard this recently and it's, and it's been kind of, I've, I brought it up a lot because I guess it's just, it's been relevant in so many different aspects, but something else that you said, um, is kind of setting yourself up with expectations and the line. And I'm, I, I need to find who said it, but it's, it's when you turn expectations into appreciation, I think that's kind of like the key to life and the key to happiness and not complaining. Um, because when you expect all these things and, you know, anytime something doesn't hit your expectations, you then think it's, it's not as good or you start complaining, but when you just turn everything into an appreciation, um, there's not room for, there's not too much room for, for complaining. So, uh, just a few, few thoughts I had there. Uh, any, any final thoughts on this whole topic before you get into business? No, I love it. And I love that idea of expectations. That is a big deal. Um, in, uh, my, again, my prior life in professional or amateur, like high level athletics, right? Of like managing those expectations to continue to climb. And I think it's like, if you have expectations for yourself, you don't, you know, have it, use your expectations on yourself, right? That way there's not a lot left to like impose mm -hmm. on those around you so that you have the appropriate balance of like, you know, hey, I'm happy with my standing. Yeah, nice. We spend a lot of time. It's one of the most important things in our business is setting the right expectations. And I think, you know, diving into into the business side, it seems like on the company side, I mean, that's what you help track is tracking expectations. How how well is your campaign doing? You know, where should we focus more? Where should we focus less? So, I'm excited to dive into that portion of it as well. Sure. Yeah. The and, uh, go ahead, sorry, Josh. No, no, you. I was going to say, yeah, expectations also, you know, a lot of what we do and um, I think help, help our clients understand is not just what to expect from their campaigns, but how to think about what, um, what they should even be considering success in the first place to then build like a set of like follow-ons, right? Or, you know, as you mentioned, expectations. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um... And now I'd like to learn a little bit more about your business, Bonsai, uh, because obviously part of our goal with the podcast is to build this referral network among our guests uh, that pro collaboration and support. Um, so just want to learn a little bit more about the business. How did you get your start and, and how did you get your first customer? Yeah, so uh, Bonsai is, so as you teed us up so nicely at the top, so we're a measurement shop, right? So we measure and generate um, value for our clients uh, with our platform. Uh, we do it through really the the kind of three most important ways you need to measure the success of marketing, but do it with the data that matters, which is your business data. So we do we do test measurement, we do modeling, we do attribution, and then we help companies build algorithms uh, to activate on that. Um, you know, we got started not as a software platform, but actually. Uh, really, it was, I always say, it's like two guys in a business card. So we were a consultancy first and foremost. So um, my background is uh, the analytics, the digital side. So I had spent about uh, about a dozen years at Google, um, was really fortunate to be there. At the time I was there, I got to help start and sort of see through their, uh, really the analyst organization and profession within the business organization at Google. So. I like, I would always tell the people that we would be bringing in to do kind of my job um, as I was like going on to do other things, right? Like the analysts, the analytical leads, the the data science folks that they have at Google today, like they're all like way smarter than me, right? Like I, I when I got into it, it was very brand new. Like they, they kind of let jokers like me through the door because there was no precedent for it. Um, but there was like, even in whatever, 2008 or nine or, you know, whatever it was, right? There was whether or not even at Google knew it, right? Like the success or failure of a business online was no longer just about the, the kind of mad men concepts that we all understand that are critical to the foundations of marketing. It was also this science, right? It was this exchange of information, right? There was auctions, there was reams of analytic data. Like it was sort of all, I mean, I think many people would argue still new to the space, but um, it required 
folks who one had a knack for it and a passion for it, but wanted to like the intersection of data at scale and, and how that could affect successful marketing. Um, so yeah, so like I got started um, obviously at Google and then saw a good good amount of my professional success there till like really the late teens, like so about 2017, 18, I got into professional services within their organization. And um, my motivation was to help solve things outside of just advertising measurement. So Google obviously has Google Cloud Platform. They're, um, this is all kind of trite and obvious today, but like obviously like they have a lot more information than just stuff about ads, right? And so it's a really powerful, incredible place. And so I, I was you know fortunate enough to be in a position where I got to see and 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 oversee and run some of the biggest relationships Google had in the U.S. in the in the retail sector and then a few others and as you kind of got up the chain right like it was clear we were coming close to solving almost everything we could on like making their Google ad dollar go further but that was one of just many problems you have at the most strategic levels right so you know what product should be in our stores when should we buy that product. Um, when should our store be open? Who should we, who should we be targeting? And like, how, how do we fulfill? And um, gosh, there's just so much stuff that I didn't understand or know anything about, but I knew that like in, integrated information and technology and, and particularly from a cloud perspective was important. Um, my co-founder's from aerospace. So Mike Kremke, um, not from my world in, in digital analytics, but he is an, you know, he's the real engineer. Um, yeah, so he had worked in aerospace and defense for a while, uh, actually longer than I had been in in tech. And uh, yeah, I think when we put our heads together and I introduced him to my world and I learned a lot about what he did and you know, kind of we went back along, you know, a long ways before our, our business days. But uh, you know, the the shared understanding we had was uh, there were a lot of problems to solve, uh, business and information in the marketing sphere in general was one of the areas that needed the most help that seemed to have the least amount of folks really applying like the right way of thinking and then obviously the right technology to solve them um and i say that because like what i recognized in the and in, in mike and then like what what exists in sort of the aerospace or let's just call it like the manufacturing sector of the economy is a completely different attitude and 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 concept of how you think about anything with respect to process and data, right? So we used to always joke that I, I would tell Mike that, you know, hey, I, you know, I bet you the CEO of Walmart couldn't name their top 100 customers if, you know, they had a, if they had a gun to their head, right? And he'd be like, oh, it's impossible, right? I, I come from a world, this is Mike talking, right? So I'm doing a terrible impression. Um, you know, that's impossible, Matt. Uh, I manage a factory that produces, you know, XYZ parts for all of Boeing and if a single one sixteen screw, like if we're off by one out of like a million on the floor, like, yeah, we might go to jail, right? Like, like there's no, uh, like that's, you know, that, that's just a completely different standard and approach. And so I, I was like, I don't, I don't understand that world as, as well as he does, but I know that like, whatever, whatever makes that work that way, that's what we need in business and marketing. <laughs> like, that pro like that's the that's the standards the practices the whatever goes into all that right and so like we yeah i mean our first customer was ancestry um we had uh i don't know if that's totally true we had a few pilot smaller clients maybe before them that were let's just say that i'm not sure they were really paying clients but we we were we were teasing out like well what is it we do like how do we help an organization understand its information and then build a a growth strategy on top of that first party data. But um, yeah, I mean, like that's that's how it got going. 2020 happened, the pandemic happened. We got into a, a great relationship helping Ancestry kind of rethink how they wanted to orchestrate and measure their marketing success, uh, which then led into like a whole slew of where we're at today around like having an actual um, solution and technology to, to do those things and, and more. But um, But yeah, that was, that was probably more than you bargained for, but that was that's my background on it. How did you how did you get that ancestry uh, lead? Like, how did you how did that happen? Uh, I don't remember every detail of it, but I do remember being surprised that I remember we had a website. This was like when we 
<laughs> very, very first days of starting. I'm talking like first few weeks of bonsai in existence. I think there was like a one page like Squarespace link for like bonsai.llc and like a little picture of a tree. And I got a I got like a lead form. Like I got like, you know, the analytics director, a uh, friend of mine, Audrey Bauer, she uh I remember getting the getting we got like the email we're like, wait, ancestry? <laughs> like, and then like separately there was uh some folks uh uh some folks that I uh had a prior connection with at Google years ago. Uh they uh, a gentleman by the name of Todd Pollock, who was a he was not the chief revenue officer at Ancestry at the time, but um, he did not pull up the web form. But he did reach out to, you know, separately after when I decided to leave Google saying, hey, you know, oh, is this, you know, Bonsai, is this like a side project or, you know, what is this? I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I think it's, you know, it's going to be a full time thing. Like we're we want to get into first party data and, and growth strategy. And so he's like, yeah, no, we should set up a conversation and talk. And, and to be honest, it moved. And I don't know if this was just the circumstances of 2020 and and uh, the pandemic at the time, or I, I don't exactly know what went into it, but we we got uh, basically a, we put together like a survey for them around like the kind of things they wanted help with, and we ended up getting a consulting deal like within like the like a few like months later. That's a great story. Uh, where where do you get most of your business now? You know, whether it's referrals, word of mouth, ads, networking, whatever it is. Yeah, we're still really, um, we're just getting into the phase of beginning to like go to market, to be honest. Um, so that like really is just beginning this year uh, up until even 2024. Uh, our clientele come really from two places, right? So it's come from existing customers, like referring other like folks in their vertical or space that they like consider us a fit for or we've had a few like clients of ours move from one enterprise to another or client to client. And so a lot of them have brought bonsai with, uh, to their new companies. Um, and then we've had a little bit of organic, uh, exposure now, now that we've gotten, uh, you know, a few years under our belt. And so there's been some companies that have reached out saying, uh, you know, Oh, I see you've done, um, good work for, you know, well, now urgent care, we're in the urgent care space. So like, you know, so that's not referral driven, but sort of a little bit of that sort of, uh, you know, sort of market presence and and having the, the the name out there. Perfect. And then to get into you know some of the the services uh, that you guys provide and and really what these questions are aimed to to do is to how can you help other companies and how can other companies, especially agencies, help yeah. you? So uh, three questions there. The first just is you know what services or what does the product whether you want to take it into a feature or benefit space? Uh, what do you guys provide? Yeah. So this is actually a really exciting thing for us this year is we've we've taken what we do at Bonsai and productized. So our platform is called Overstory. As a side note, Josh, I actually don't know when this podcast is going to run, but we're doing a webinar on the 8th, but that might be irrelevant for this particular podcast. July 8th? No, yeah. this this will post after that. Yeah, that's fine. But um, I, I'll just... Sorry, you can edit all that out. Um, oh, you just had a you just had a webinar as a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, so Overstory, yeah. So, so, so Overstory is our measurement platform. So, what it is is uh, essentially a way we've you know democratized how to what used to be so stuff that we could only provide as a service. So, advanced marketing measurement through you know bespoke multi-touch attribution on your first party data, match market testing, and then media mix modeling, essentially. Those are the three major uh, capabilities that Overstory now does as a product. So we've moved from like those, you know, every every integration's slightly different and more of like, a, you know, we'll embed in your team and help you build that. We now, like we have the, basically we have the recipe, if that makes sense. And so we understand like what are the things that you need to do this and do this really well. So Overstory is like one, it's your marketing cloud, right? That you don't need to like hire your own internal data science teams to build. Like we understand if you're a retailer, what that cloud needs to look like. We then understand how our measurement products, right, get built on top of that. And so through Overstory, you get to, you know, what as opposed to like taking all that time up front to to build it yourself, we integrate directly. So like. I think we're up to like 38 or 39 different platforms. We integrate um, Overstory can sit on top of 
uh, and and tie into you know your Google Ads, your marketing platform, uh, Facebook, your you know Twitter's, Reddit's, all that stuff. We bring it in seamlessly, and then like the real magic, uh, and I think a real differentiator that is very challenging to do without the right set of of tech and 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 a partner is how do you wrangle the business data? So business data is typically not just sitting in a nice neat package that's been you know architected by the you know thousands of engineers at facebook right so these are data that come from pos systems or your online portal plus your pos or you know various integrations that are in various states of uh disrepair <laughs> if that's a nice way to say it so we we understand that and we understand like the specific playbook to connect uh to your business data in the cloud that it's on or in this you know kind of service that environment that it lives on we onboard it and then we um, when you get attribution through us you're getting customer level data right business outcomes right it's not like how many google conversions can you attribute it's what's the net profit from these 10 customers how does that get attributed to your marketing touch points right and then same thing for like test measurement, same thing for incrementality modeling, right? For, for the things that are not digital media or in general that don't that don't generate a bunch of observable touch points, that's really critical, right? Because I can't I can't put, you know, whether or not Matt saw a TV ad into an attribution model, right? There's no click there. I need to understand that using different techniques. And so so Bonsai's packaged all that and Overstory is able to to deliver that. And you know, uh, other things that we're excited about is, you know, brands and then frankly agencies which I'll you know hit on now so we we also see and have seen now for multiple years how hard it is even if you get all the right data science even if you had all this sophisticated measurement in house it's not straightforward like how should i visualize this for my board how should i visualize this for my cmo what does my practitioner need to see like what is actionable Literally, what should the report look like? And how do I, you know, who decides that? And like, how should that work, right? Because translating all of this great data into something a marketer can use or an agency uh, team can go buy media better with, right? Whether it be different media plans or different bidding strategies or whatever, right? Like that takes a certain level of uh, not just data com competence, but it takes a ton of domain experience. And so, our platform has been built on on top of what we've developed here at Bonsai around that. So like folks get reporting that is really clean and nice, easy to, to read, but also speaks specifically to go, you know, this is what you need to do, right? Like I is high over here, low over here. This thing needs to be bigger next month by this much. And like, you need to adjust your bids by this much in Google, that, that kind of, uh, I guess on the boots on the ground stuff that like an agency would would you know that they yearn for right that you you know you don't want to have your measurement team just living in a silo in the corner saying like smart stuff that no one understands right we we're, we're passionate about it being um resonant with the practitioner so uh so yeah uh clients directly can obviously like the, the whole point of it is first party data so of course that's the the underpinning like businesses get this overstory platform as their own but this can be a solution for uh, one customer or it can be a solution for an entire agency suite. And I guess the next part I want to ask is a little bit more unique for you because most of the companies that we have on here um, are a marketing agency. So this question is really posed for marketing agencies, but want to get your kind of answer to it as well. Um, how can you work with other marketing agencies or companies and what services can you partner with other agencies? So in other words, you know, what do agencies tend to reach out to you for? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, through Bonsai's like evolution to where we're at today, we've intersected the marketing agency space in multiple ways. Um, we've had customers try to like use us as their agency, like, which is, which is great, right? It's also like uh, at, at, at scale, we, you know, see like the opportunity to be a partner to the existing agency ecosystem. So, you know, what I mean by that is, um, you know, Bonsai is not employing, like, I, I don't have a team of like, you know, 500 folks, right? With, with, with offices in every city and, you know, a client team on the ready to like take on 
you know, an engagement that requires a lot of hands on deck, right? But what we do have is a scalable infrastructure and we can take on the, the hardest, most complicated data challenges, right? And so um, I would say the, the main way, like there's, I'll boil it into like two, four ways. Solving measurement and solving it really well is, is not easy to do. And a marketing agency that's being tasked with, you know, the ultimately like they're the custodians of the growth and success of like an entire company's buy from the media planning to the strategy to the execution to, to, to pigeonhole in like really sophisticated, accurate measurement is like within some agency scope, but a lot of times you're basically robbing Peter to pay Paul to do that, right? Like, do you want to be putting your agency's best minds on solving that when you need those minds on media planning, when you need them on strip, you know, you need them elsewhere and, and you might only do like 80% of good a job as we can do on measure, right? And so it's just like, again, it's like a lot of specializations where it's like, we're just really, really well suited to be your faster, better answer to get you the actual, um, you're not gonna have to churn through like a six month project to get your media mix model done. You're gonna get a better model from us way faster. And if that keeps, um, you know, I think a lot of marketing agencies might think of that as like a great uh, retention tool uh, to like add value to like what they already have. But the honest answer is if measurement is being used the right way, if you're using Bonsai and Overstore the right way, it's allocating dollars to the things that work better, which means that growth is going up, which means your clients business is growing, which means their marketing budgets are going to grow, which means you as the agency are going to have a bigger client, right? So I think, you know, now there's a lot of steps there, but I think that's like the most symbiotic. Uh, the second, and this is like actually kind of the one I get most excited about, but it's a little, it's certainly like the, you know, even in our world, like the more bleeding edge side of it is we were like, we're really passionate about the data doing something, not just sitting in the dashboard. Um, so we build algorithms. So what we found is that better, like really sophisticated incrementality measurement can be used as data directly in models. And those models can train Google to, to buy better for you, to train Facebook to buy better for you. So most agencies are using um, Google's Fitting algorithms and AI to like optimize their media. And, and in general, like, there's something wrong with that. That's like the standard practice. Uh, same thing on Facebook, right? Like most sophisticated performance marketing agencies, they're using Facebook's uh, AI to, you know, kind of optimize how they bid and target their ads. But Facebook's data doesn't know incremental impact. Google's data doesn't know incremental impact and Bonsai's data does. And like, we're a technology that gives an agency, like if a client's like, Hey, you know, I wish you'd stop, you know what, you know, this, these conversions are growing, but my, my bottom line is not growing as fast as you're saying, you know, are these conversions incremental and agency is from a purely operational perspective, like their hands are kind of tied when all they have is what the data they get from Google's tracking pixel or Facebook's tracking pixel. Because to be clear, they got the greatest AI in the world. Google can never know incrementality. Facebook can never know incrementality. No third party technology can know what's driving real incremental outcomes for your business. That only comes from your data. That only comes from your first party data that's been unified and deployed. And so um, it can be as simple as like, hey, I wish, you know, you know, as an agency, we would we would optimize media to incrementality if we could, bonsai. Perfect. So oh, that, that was a great end too. <laughs> uh, and then just flip the question over and we'll get to a few of the last questions. I know we're kind of running over time here, um, but what do you usually outsource to other marketing agencies? So do you ever get requests from clients maybe or, or whoever that you refer to another agency or you would refer to an agency? Yes, there's a, actually a multiple. Um, I guess lowest hanging is like anyone who does any intersection with search at any point, I feel like gets the same question from time to time, uh, which Bonsai gets around SEO. So <laughs> every week, usually we'll get at least one like SEO ask, like, oh, do you get, you know, are you guys an SEO shop? And right. yeah, yeah. so like, yeah, happy to, um, you know, that's obviously like a whole other conversation, but like interesting space. And so we're happy to refer folks to, you know, kind of like firms that really specialize in, in just SEO. And then like design is the other huge one. Um, and this is like, by the way, we're always, we actually like 
advocate, we'll, we'll tell clients to go like, hey, you need to improve customer experience, right? Let's, <laughs> this website sucks, right? Like it's, you know, like simple idea, but like, yeah. So, so web design, app design, um, CX shops, we actively take clients that we think would benefit from that and we refer. That's perfect. Cause you know, obviously our goal is to just be passing around referrals and, and things between our guests. So uh, we'll kind of s- section this, this, the last two questions out. Well, uh, put in the, the beginning of the episode so people can kind of find you guys or we'll obviously make the connections. Last question, maybe my favorite question. Uh, I asked a lot of fun questions in the beginning. At least. Yeah. Uh, but any uh, book, podcast, or newsletter recommendations? Yes. <laughs> book is the Book of Why. I think that's the title. You're going to have to edit this if I got the title wrong. Uh, I think it's, it's Pearl, Food of Pearl. Oh God. Now you see, this is the problem. Now your my short-term memory is kicking in and it's, no, I think, I think you got it. The book of why. Yeah. Yeah. You, book you of why. It. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. book of why, uh, how can I tease the book? Um, it is. I actually really recommend it to people who are in data and analytics or consider themselves statistically minded. Um, it's it's a great, I mean, there's a lot of academics in that book, but it's beautifully told. And it basically explains that you can understand how something works. And that cause is not like this made up concept that sometimes gets bantered about and especially the higher up you go in, in in statistical circles, you'll start to have this erosion of like, well, nothing really can be known. Like that's not how science works. It's all, and it's like, well, I, that's definitely not how that author would describe the point of that book. But it's one of the many things that I took away of like understanding that like things like the question why I have an answer, and there's certain ways you can quantify that. It's a big one. Um, scale, Jeffrey West, I want to say, another big. Um, it's got a title that makes you think it's like a 10 step process to make your, you know, it's not like a get rich, get rich quick scheme at, at first, but it's definitely not that it's a, uh, another really interesting book, uh, basically describing how, uh, you will see the world a very different way after reading that book. At least I did. Um, long story short, like people, cities, schools, things on your desk, plants they're all very similar in very interesting ways uh i'm i'm kind of yeah every time i'm looking up i'm just lo- looking at the book a little bit um have you read sapiens is it related to sapiens at sapiens all? that's the one by harari right uh Yuval, is, is, Yuval, yeah 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 uh no sapiens is a great compliment to scale i've read sapiens i also recommend that book sapiens is a story of the culture, I think, of what we are. Yeah, yeah. Scale makes a compelling case to to describe that many things are dictated by physics and forces outside of which we might expect. Oh, interesting. Oh, well, I'm I'm like eighty percent done uh, sapiens, so it's very top of mind. So I'll, I'll check this out after. That's perfect. Um, and as we come up to the end of the episode, I just want to give you an opportunity to mention how people can find you and anything else you'd like to end with. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you can find Bonsai at bonsai.llc. I'm on LinkedIn. I got a very boring, simple name. I think I'm LinkedIn, you know, dot com, whatever it is, slash Butler Mac. Um, and I think that's maybe where you'll find me unless you're in the Chicagoland area. You know, please hopefully find me out, um, you know, on a golf course sometime before the end of the summer, too. Uh, I did promise uh, we could talk Bears football right after this. So I'll end it right here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, And for those of you who have learned something new from this episode, please consider giving us a like or a follow so we can continue getting the highest quality guests. And as always, thank you for listening. Matt, I I love this episode. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Masters in Marketing Agency podcast. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I just want to thank our sponsors, DevNoodle. DevNoodle provides marketing agencies with the ability to offer their clients unlimited website design, build, and management services with fixed monthly plans. If website design, development, and maintenance is holding your agency back from growing, please reach out to us at devnoodle.com, where we make websites easy. Easy for you, 
and easy for your clients, devnoodle.com.